I grew up out of the gutter. I grew up out of the gutter, robbing and stealing, hiding from the police. I was told that maybe 12 years old, one of my cousins called me shooting hooky from school once. And I thought she was out of the house, but actually she was still there. I thought she had gone to work. I sneaked in the window. My mother had given me the lunch. I'd ate my lunch, come back to sneak in the window to go to sleep. I hated school. And my cousin told me when she called me, I tried to make an excuse like a guilty person do. She said, don't worry about it. You're nothing. You're never going to be nothing anyway. She said, go to sleep. She said, nobody from around here ever become anything but drunks. Foreman in the white shirt. Shapoulos of the Soviet Union in the red shirt. We've got 50 seconds left in the second round. Soviet fighter is moving away. He is holding on. He appears to this reporter to have had enough. But the fight goes on. Amritaifo of Ghana has not... That's it. That's it. Referee stops contest. Probably the, the greatest thing that when I look back on it, being a 19-year-old in the 1968 Olympics, well, actually, I didn't think I would win the, the, uh, the gold medal. I was, didn't understand how I got there in the first place. And I can remember calling my mother each time I'd win and say, well, even if I don't win another, I've got a silver medal or a bronze medal. There I am in a gold medal match, and I had a small American flag for good luck in my robe, along with a lucky penny, beads, and a picture of a girlfriend. All these things were supposed to help me win. But I figured if I won a boxing match, generally we would bow to the audience or the judge to show our humbleness. This time, after I'd won the match, I actually had won. I bowed to the judge, and I had the flag on my side. You forget about the complexion and all of this. You, you want everybody to know what country you're from. And uh, everybody started cheering, so I started waving the flag. No demonstration or anti-demonstration. It was just a, an emotional moment. I wanted everybody to know where, that I was from the United States of America. They are putting that uniform on you with the USA and robe you down with a parade uniform. And, it's like a dream, and it didn't end, even though until this day, it hasn't ended. So when I look back on it, there's been nothing to even come close to that in the world of sports. Greatest thing, I, when I think about the greatest accomplishment, it was definitely winning that gold medal, standing up on that platform, listening to your national anthem, and thinking, boy, I made it. I started my boxing career in an anti-poverty program called the Job Corps. I entered the Job Corps to get a high school education because I was a dropout at 16. Lyndon Johnson started his program for underprivileged kids. Children. We called our program Project Head Start. I am a product of a compassionate America. I'm proof that when a country does not give up on its underprivileged, good things can happen. There was a point where I didn't really truly believe in myself. I think I went all the way through the amateur career with only 25 total matches as an amateur, trying to get a knockout to keep the other guy from knocking me out. That's the way I looked at it. Then my trainer, who I, Dick Sattler, I signed up with him in order that he would not only train me, I didn't, I didn't ask him for mo uh, any contracts or money up front. I wanted to learn the skill of boxing. And a lot of people didn't know that I wanted to be a boxer, mover, Muhammad Ali type. And uh, he promised me that he would develop me in that fashion. But as soon as we started boxing, he'd move me around the ring. He'd let me box and move. Then we had our first fight, August of 69. He said, okay, son, get out there. And you jump right on this guy. And you knock him out. He said, you draw back and knock him out. Do you hear me? I said, what? And he started, this is the way we ought to do it. And he had me so psyched up. The bell ring, and I'd imitate what we had already been rehearsing in the dressing room. So not at one, there was never a point that I thought of it as something that would be totally destructive. It was all, all really instructions from my corner man. Bang, boom, bang, boom. I mean, I was scared of Joe Frazier. Nobody could tell me anything weak about him because I, didn't, I know there weren't any weaknesses. He'd even beat Muhammad Ali at this point. And my scheme, of, of my part of psychology, from that point on early in my career, I would stare the guy down. I started getting in their face, looking them dead in the eye. If they would drop their face, I knew then I had this edge. But when getting ready to fight Joe Frazier, I had to look him in the eye, but I was hoping he wouldn't look down because my knees were uncontrollable. I couldn't stop them from shaking. I used to look at guys like uh, Henry Armstrong and watch how these guys throw punches and uh, Sugar Ray Robinson 
And see, Henry Armstrong was a guy that never stopped. He he throw like 320 in a round and said he moving. So I said if I can, I can be like that and I can do that and keep that pressure on him, he eventually break. This guy was a machine. He would eat you up. And uh, by this time, I won the gold medal. I thought that I could become champion if Joe Frazier would have an accident or something. <laughs> he did. I'm hoping I, I did said, have a he, did. he ran into him. <laughs> This time, I had watched Joe Frazier fight. Followed his whole career by being on his undercard. I remember seeing him fight Jerry Quarry, and I mean Jerry Quarry was putting it to Joe Frazier like nothing. And after four or five rounds, Joe Frazier went in front of the camera, looked at his trainer and said, whoo, as though he liked it. And I kept thinking, I want to become champion, but I hope Joe Frazier dies first. Foreman having a very good round. famous left hook and it just barely missed me. It sounded like a pistol. No, like a rifle. A bullet just going past your head. And I knew then that if I didn't hurry up and get that fight over, that I stood not only a chance of losing the match, but really getting myself seriously hurt. Right now, that was my main goal was to win the world heavyweight championship. You got it now. I felt that I was faster. I felt that I was a little smarter. Kenny Norton was a fearsome specimen to watch. He was a throwback to some of the old gladiators. So this man was really a... Uh, you didn't want to, I was forced to fight the number one contender. And uh, that way I, I, I made up, the, of course, I was matched with Kenny Norton. Didn't want that match. <laughs>
Hutton, just like he do all his opponents, caught him out. I'm meeting his heart, but if the man can stay out of the way for five rounds, stick him, move, stay out of range, be in good shape, he'll retire George Foreman. This man depends on getting his man in the first one or two rounds. If he don't do that, he's frustrated. Stick him in left jabs and right crosses, tie him up and box him, and you will retire. Now, Ali. I'm going to man is going to whoop George Foreman, and I'm going to whoop him of all places in Africa, in the Congo, where the Lumumba boys are. Now, Ali, now that you have your cool about you and you calm down at this point, I want you to answer this question. How could that man go 24 rounds with you and only two with the heavyweight champion of the world? Because George Foreman is not as good of a fighter scientific as I am, but I admit he's stronger and he hit harder. I'm not a hard puncher. I'm not known for being a hard puncher. I fought many men like Floyd Patterson, Zora Foley, George Fowler, who are stronger than I am. Many I couldn't knock out, Sonny Liston. But I'll tell you this, boxing ability, speed, whooping him on point for the distance if necessary. Then I'll whoop him. Well, fight in your home territory. You couldn't be any happier the way this is coming up in September. Why would you call Africa my home territory? You've been telling me that for 10 years. That's right, and if you come over there talking like that, we'll cook you. George, tell me about the fight that you had with Kenny Norton. I really didn't want that fight, but I was put in a position where I had to take it by the governing bodies. And I didn't want to fight Norton. But he was advised, I, I, I figured because he, he is so good, and he, so word go around that George Foreman keeps his head straight up, that he would try for a knockout. I think if the fight had gone five rounds, he could have whipped me too. But he started throwing big hooks early. And we got into an exchange, and I got the better of him. <laughs> and I kept thinking. I remember I knocked him down. I said, I better get him while he's down, too. I even got him then. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to get oh, up. Oh, fart. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want him to get up because I knew if this guy getting warmed up, this fight would never end. Did you try to go blow for blow? I was going to go out. Act like I was going to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, make him load up, back off, and counter. Mm -hmm. And use my... Hook. But as you saw in the fight, when he loaded up, I backed up and I kept backing and kept backing <laughs> and I stumbled. <laughs> of course, I would knocked out Joe Frazier and uh, uh, beat him convincingly, of course. Then I knocked out Kenny Norton, who was, I figured, the greatest physical specimen one could ever look at. And I was kind of afraid of Kenny Norton, but I did win the boxing match. I was able to eliminate guys pretty easily who had really given Muhammad Ali a whipping. So people were telling me, George, be careful, don't kill Muhammad. He's old, take it easy. The, uh, the adjectives used in the press has been beautiful. The more strong man they make this guy, the better I like it, because Mike Paul's got plenty to shoot for now. He's the underdog twice, gonna shock the world and become the heavyweight champ of the world again. I've always said he's the greatest heavyweight of all time. He has to lick Foreman to make the press admit this. I've been working four months for this fight. My weight today is 214 pounds. That's fight weight already. I'm way ahead of schedule. My time and my accuracy, my reach will be an inch and a half longer. The man is slower. The man is flat-footed. The man don't stand a chance. The stage has been set. This man is supposed to annihilate me. Ten years from Sunday Lister, I'm supposed to be get it that time. I think it's befitting that I go out of boxing just like I came in. Shocking the world by beating a big, bad, ugly monster that nobody could beat. I got into Africa 15 days prior to the boxing match, 10 days prior to the boxing match. I suffered a cut, and uh, they wouldn't let me out of Africa. I found out quickly that all the airlines flying in and out were controlled by the people and the president of Zaire or whatever, and George Foreman could not leave town. One minute left in round number one. The heavyweight championship between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman, high via satellite, direct from Zaire, Africa. That punch and no damage, that one did. Two wild white hands taken on the side of the head of Muhammad Ali. Ali continues to try to tie his man up. Back late, separates him. Wild left hand, fits the hook. There's a real strong right hand just underneath the heart. And Muhammad Ali is taking some punishment. 25 seconds left in the round. Ali, face left, throws the straight right hand. That right hand lead has George Foreman slightly confused, but a straight left jab thrown by Foreman. Has Ali in the corner. Ali dances back. Here he's on. What a tremendous, tremendous face in round number one. A hook to the body of Muhammad Ali. Zach Layton, the referee, separates.
Price with about eight seconds left in the round. Round one, Foreman and Ali in the round one. There were seven rounds of this, I'll be finished. So I realized this, I stopped and let him run his in it while I lay on the ropes. During the game we call the open door. Foreman setting him up against the rope. Oh, he's getting by Ali. Ali definitely showing the hand speed in this fight. There's the chance. Ali for Baye. That means Ali kill him. In the sporting sense of four. Ali making a look a bit off with that punch. Good no damage again. Kicking it to the head of Muhammad Ali. But that punch did. I hit him with a good shot. You know what he told me? That all you got. The air of Foreman. Why he continues to taunt him. Ali's super confident. Foreman looks unusually slow with his hands. Look at this. Now. All of a sudden, he opens up. Four punches downstairs on Ali. Ali, of course, has protection around that area he was being hit by. Ali showing the ability to punch inside against George Foreman. Now the fight is hurt him, it sort of took his, dehumanized him. He looked at me as if to say, I'm not going to take that from you. And he came after me, he remembered the pain, and then he said, forget it, and covered up. Covered my fingers. Get off the ropes, get off the ropes, move, move. So I told him I'm going to fight my way, I'm going to do it my way, and shut up. I went to finish him off two rounds. I said, I'm going. I don't care about the five, six rounds. I'm going to knock him out in two rounds. Third round, he was still there. I said, well, who cares? I'm not going to pace myself. I'm going to knock him out. Finally, after five or six rounds, I was burnt out. This experienced great athlete withstood all of his pain because I hit him with some of the hardest shots I'd ever delivered on a man. It would knock him back and out. He would literally stand there and wake up again. Very even fight. Ali, a sneaky right hand. Another sneaky right hand. This time he worked over the shoulder of Foreman. I burnt myself out and he caught me with the right hand just as I was walking and following him without any respect, just trying to get one shot in. Tricked me, moved off the rope with this lightning speed that he was not supposed to have at this age. One-two combination caught me right on the chin. I said, I can't believe it. I hit the floor. Actually, I hit the floor again with my fist. I waited for my corner to tell me to get up. A boxer is not supposed to get up. He's supposed to wait until his corner says get up. My manager told me to get up. He counted for me. When I jumped up, the fight was over. I had lost the heavyweight championship of the world to Mohammed Ali, and there he was with his hands raised. <laughs> and I had to eat crow feet. Do you think to this day that the ropes were made loose that night on purpose? Everybody needs an excuse. I couldn't live with myself without an excuse, so I blamed it on the rope, I blamed it on everything. <laughs> that devastated me. I was undefeated. Never had lost a boxing match. 
You had a difficult time. And so I couldn't adjust to that. So you give me an excuse. I was, I was picking them out of the air. Oh, yeah. Mm. My shoes were too big. Anything. Joe Frazier thought this is the time to get George. He's weak. Be right back in the title picture. And uh, he fought me again. And, of course, I, he tried to box me, use his skill. He was a lot older and smarter. And he was able to go a lot longer, about five rounds. But eventually I did catch up with him. And we got a knockout. But he, I made sure he... He missed me with those left hooks, of course. And here comes Joe Frazier. A man who has brought nothing but decency and integrity and indefatigable effort to his trade. And look what he's done. Look what Joe Frazier has done. He shaved his head. Frazier trying to fight back. Foreman dominating. Round five. Foreman got in, good coming, and again, you saw it there. Frazier's hurt. Frazier's hurt again. One right hurt Frazier. Frazier, Frazier's down. Frazier is down from a right. The mandatory eight count. George Foreman looking revived tonight. Frazier getting the left. Frazier getting the right. Frazier taking it from George Foreman. Foreman, not Foreman again with the right. Second knockdown in the round. One more knockdown, this fight is over. Five. George Foreman struggling to, Seven. Joe Frazier struggling Eight. to his feet. George Foreman poised in the neutral corner. Look at him, in total command now. says the fight is over. George Foreman wins in the fifth round by a technical knockout. Over 10 years ago, I stopped boxing. At an age where everybody said, hey, you shouldn't do it. I became a full-time evangelist. And I would read articles about George Foreman as a coward. He's scared. He's trying to make up an excuse. He's He's got a crutch. He's a coward. Now he's using a crutch as the Bible. The Bible is a crutch. I had to eat all that up, and I did eat it for 10 years. And I, I took on that challenge and was a full-time preacher and minister and took care of churches, built them, traveled around the world, giving my testimony when a lot of people looked at me oddly. That was the true challenge. The true challenge was not the staring Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali down, but picking up a Bible and going around the country telling people that God loves you. I retired to be a full-time minister and didn't see how sports or boxing could help any kid. So right now I'm trying to keep that baton going by the George Foreman Youth and Community Center in Houston, Texas. And we also have scholarships and journalism across the country to help kids get education and to try to get the message out to athletes that you can't be whatever you are forever. You're going to have to get into something else. And uh, I like to, uh, to make a contribution that other athletes have to follow in that area. My brother Roy and me started the George Foreman Youth and Community Center about four years ago, which is why I got back into boxing. Not been at making boxers or wrestlers, but showing kids that someone care about them. To provide a place where role models were. Showing them that everybody's not stealing stereos out of cars, breaking into people's houses, and uh, getting loaded and not facing reality. Not telling them nothing, but just being a light for them by example. And uh, giving them a little something, loaning them a dollar to uh, giving them a book to read, and then, you know, when you make a bad grade, I care about it too. And you can't preach a sermon, you just got to be a sermon. I'm proud of the fact that I'm older. It's sort of strange when you think about being a youth, getting into that ring with the lack of knowledge that I had at that time. It was a dangerous sport to me at that point. Now, with all I know, it's, it's a game. It's truly the boxing game now. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I've lived, I've been in Mike Tyson's shoes. I know exactly what he can and what he cannot do. I know how he's going to feel a moment before he walks up those steps. I've lived all that. I've been through it. I know how it feels to be portrayed as indestructible and knowing realistically that nobody is. So, and at this stage in my life, knowing all of these things, generally when a fellow comes uh, to this realization, his days of boxing and athletics are over. I was able to preserve myself by not being a smoker or a drinker. And of course, I've been, had uh, someone watching over me. I've been a preacher for the last 10, 15, 10 years, I know. And so it's qualified me to be physically able to.
to train hard, and that's all it takes. It doesn't take a lot of punching power in the ring. Can you really get in there and train hard and prepare yourself for a match? So I could actually fight Mike Tyson and allow him to show the world that he has other skills other than knocking people out. Prove to them that he can also box because I could put him in a position where he'd have to literally run. There's no doubt in my mind a man would have to be totally insane to think that Mike Tyson could whip me today because I'm in better shape than he is right now. Right now, he would have to get in the gym to fight me. I wouldn't have to go into the gym. I fight all the time. Former heavyweight champion George Foreman continues his comeback trail. 17-0 since the return to the ring, 17 knockouts. The quality of the competition has been questioned, but Foreman maintains this is the only competition he can get. Experts feel it's the only competition he'll accept, so he racks up the knockout. There's no pressure to me. I'm not a kid anymore. I take everything as it's just walk down the street. I never lose a day. I never, uh, uh, for instance, I used to be smaller as a boxer because I practice dehydration, going without licorice for certain days. I don't even put any pressures on myself. Uh, hours prior to a boxing match, people are coming to my dressing room, taking pictures. We're talking. I'm not going to lose a second out of my life taking this stuff serious because boxing is a sport. It's a lot of fun if you take it like that. And, uh, I don't have any pressure on me. The pressure is on the other guys who are going to have to cut back on water and all of that to fight me. And very lean. unpredictable fighter. He's very lean at 215. An imposing, awesome figure. The former heavyweight champion of the world. Oh, All right. Jaco Winston thing. I think it went was, down to the cabin. I think it was more like a sledgehammer. Yes. And down again. Went down as he was trying to throw a counter punch. Flat on his back. Eyes looking up at referee Robert Bird. He's up. Been down twice now here in the first round. Does he have anything left? Down he goes from the left. I thought about losing weight, but I've told people, and I keep telling people, you do not tell a lion to lose weight to fight a house cat, just because the house cat got a reputation of being tough. A lion, hey, what you need to lose weight for? Just jump on him and chew him apart. Don't let's lose weight. I'm a big man. I like being big. You just don't knock mountains down. Well, I just don't know how that set pattern of uh, stand-up jab. Movement now uh, is uh, Williams having trouble uh, landing. But they keep it. Other left, down goes the Gator. The Gator down, we've got uh, about a minute and a half in the third round. Uh, of course, he seems like he wants to continue. So, okay, but, uh, I don't know, let's see. Uh, seems to be in trouble with the Gator here, though. It's uh, got a minute and a half remaining in the third round, and I, I think one more knockdown and uh, definitely back to others and look to stop it. Foreman is to the right now. Foreman uh, can do anything he wants. And, uh, At this point, I think so. Uh, he's in complete control, and he knows he can land as well. And, one more left hook is going to put Gator down. Yeah. I think that should be up the corner. Yeah. The way that's there. They have the fair wave of the call, uh, John. A wise decision. Yeah. Doesn't meet the approval of the crowd. I think so. Very wise. Our uh, figures say it's 2 11 of the third. Not going to win for the George Foreman. 
We'll see. For a slow -mo, we'll see that knockout. Here we are. There's the left there. He comes back to the left side. Texan Charlie Hostetter. First round action here. He gets Hostetter with a blow to the abdomen, and that's enough. Hostetter goes down. He took a count of eight and was back up. Weathered the second round. All right. We're now in the third. And of course, he's never been quick of foot, but he still punches like the kick of a mule. Good left hook there. That starts the process. And a good straight jab. And Foreman now with a roundhouse left hook. Just grazed Hostetter's head. Gets him on the rope, Hofstetter obviously unable to defend himself. Finishes him off with the right hand of the head. Missed with the final left hand. And Hofstetter is counted out by the official. 201, around number three, George Foreman with his second consecutive victory. He began his comeback four months ago in Sacramento. Foreman says he would like a couple more fights. Then he says he will be ready to take on heavyweight champ Mike Tyson. That could be tough, but if the 39-year-old foreman can land a punch, you can bring down anybody. You train hard, you work hard, you get yourself in good physical shape. I know how it feels to be out of shape. I know what it feels to be in shape. And I know how to fight. At this time, I've had more experience than any active fighter today, so I'm almost an expert. Man playing with boys. But he has certainly shown the punch. It's a question when he goes to a top 10 fighter, or even in thinking in terms of Tyson, of the other fighter just getting in those shots against the corner. There's the Hungus is down. Closing seconds, he cannot be saved by the bell. Was it behind the back? That is what the Hungus is complaining about. A kidney punch. That's the second time he's been hit there in that first round. Referee Brian Gary visiting the corner of George Foreman, telling him to watch those kidney punches. Archie Moore in that corner. Here's a look at that kidney punch. Foreman, boom. Now, in Foreman's defense, the way that Nihongo fights, he stands to his side. See how Mahangas, his, his, uh, he's standing to the side. His, his feet are not parallel to, uh, but they are parallel to Foreman's feet. Archie Moore, the age of 75. He fought until he was 49 years of age. And what a perfect man to have in the corner of George Foreman, who is now nearing his 40th birthday. Foreman stood up between rounds with his foot on the stool. This looks to be nothing more than a workout for George Foreman. Foreman complete control of this fight. The basic questions about Foreman's comeback is age at around 40, the inactivity he was out for 10 years, and also the quality of his opponents. And that is the big question right now. Foreman wants a shot at the championship. He has to step up his opponents. I talked uh, yesterday with our former colleague, Randy Gordon, who is now the New York State Boxing Commissioner. I asked him, would he sanction a Foreman Tyson fight? And he said, well, Foreman would have to pass the physical. He probably could do that. Then it was a judgment, and Randy felt it would be no contest, not competitive enough. 
He would not sanction it until Foreman proved himself against top 10 fighters. And that's just uh, uh, one commissioner of one state. And that is very difficult to do because all the top 10 fighters, obviously, want, they want to get to that top 10 because they want to fight for the championship. If you're not in the top 10, you can't fight for the title. Mihango's taking some heavy shots. This fight is only a matter of time. Halfway through round number two, it is scheduled for 10. And keep in mind, George Foreman, in his career of 57 fights, has gone the distance just four times. Last time, 1977, 11 now, years ago. Now the mat is loosening up terribly. These fighters slipping around a bit on the mat. Oh. Oh. The mat is uh, it's 18 and a half feet. Low blow by Foreman and Brian Gary warns him to keep punches up. This is certainly a mat to the advantage of Foreman, a smaller mat. Matter of fact, I wonder if they even watered it down for him before the fight. He has had no complaints, though, Sean, about the uh, loose canvas. That may be more dangerous uh, to his comeback than uh, Ladislaw Behungus. Behungus not really dangerous. Foreman moves ahead forward with his hands down. Look where his hands are. How can you have a defense when your hands are way down there by your side? Now, no question, the hard, one of the hardest hitters. Look at that. Uh, Dennis Mahungas waved off by Brian Gary. The Night Stalker moved in. Two punches into him. And George Foreman is now 11 for 11 in his comeback bid. Here is the cheers from the... George back then was a mercenary. He tore your head off. Today he's much different. He called the referee in to stop the fight. Then he would try to <laughs> kill you <laughs> and damn near do it. <laughs> I told George all the time. I tell George, like, man, you're going to bounce on guys over the ring, man. I read out of the ring. Get the flashback. That's all you need. Flashback.
Lee, but he comes out with a blow between rounds number four and number five. He looks like he's got the spring back in his step, and George continues to plod forward. JB's looking good on the on moving on that little bicycle he has. He's got to move around the ring. He does. I think that was more of a slip, not a problem. JB's tired. JB's a tired fighter. Well, you know, if you get tired of wrestling against bigger guys, I sparred with bigger guys in the, in the gym. They used to wear me out right away, even if I was a better fighter. I mean, even, he's staying outside and having some nice shots, but, you know, George almost looks impervious to pain. Uh, that sounds ridiculous, but he's taking some big shots. He's just pounding away. One thing that I, I think is important to beat people like Damiani and Deploy. People like that. I really think that he's a legitimate challenger for... Uh, Speaking of Damiani and Deploy, they'll be fighting on school next Saturday afternoon. Johnny Deploy and Francesco Damiani, the winner of Italy, will be World Boxing Organization Heavyweight Championship next Saturday, May 6th on the school. Deploy, Damiani, WBO title. That's our right, big, big left hook. Maybe the day he is hurt. Nah, maybe he's posturing here. He looked real. That's a weird so weird. Forty and a half. Hey, don't worry about it. There's nothing to it. Life, you you can do anything that I can do. I wanted to show them a little footwork at home to show them. Hey, forty year old guy got twinkle toes too. <laughs> I've gotten hit in the mouth by Muhammad Ali and Kenny Norton and Joe Frazier and and. And uh, who can say that? Who can say that? You know, I never got hit by George Foreman. Thank God. George has a good chance. No doubt about that. Uh, just like to see him turn down a little more. I like to see him a little faster. I like to see him a little crazier. You know what I mean? To get crazy out there. Not, not you know, be serious, but yet crazy serious. You know what I mean? You know, we'll tell the guy, I'm mopping you up with the flow tonight, okay, boy? Same thing. Time. Is there any questions? Shake hands. Good luck. Rocky Sikorsky was 10 years old when George Foreman won his gold medal at the Mexico Olympics in October of 1968. That's one way to put this into perspective. And a look at George Foreman, who is not exactly svelte, but at 240, a lot better off than he was at 267. 10 pounds later and 70 pounds lighter comes George into this fight, round one. He had ballooned up to over 300 at a certain point. And we're getting Rocky's defense there, and in the corner, while we were away, Sikorsky's corner, they talked about how uh, George's hands were so low that he offers virtually no defense, and how Rocky should capitalize on that. So all well enough said, but can't get done. How do you see the scoring so far? I gave the second round to Foreman, the first round to Sikorsky. Got it even at this point. Come on, break. Step back. I don't know quite what I expected coming in tonight, but I will say this, it is by far from being a total embarrassment, the two rounds I've seen to this day, not a boxing classic either. No, because it's interesting and they're, they're both landing punches. 
what it tells us about Jorge Foreman's ability to fight for a title is another thing. A long way to go from what I've seen so far before that's going to ever happen. Stand up power is there, that's not going to get out, and he's just going to try to bang his man in submission. And the jab is one thing, as we said earlier, that George Foreman has a good one. That, that's as classic as you get, and it's powerful. Considering he's almost 40 and he's had to lose all that weight, it's a fairly quick jab for a man that big. It is quick. That's the one punch this Oh, right hand that may have stunned George Foreman. Stopped him in his tracks a little bit. He did stagger with a knee. Rocky is a very wide puncher. He loses a lot of power because of the way he punches. And also, he's going after a big man. That left hook may have stunned Sikorsky. It didn't get all of him, but it got enough. And he is in trouble against the ropes. He's taking all kinds of shots with both hands from Foreman now. Trying to hold on. With that left and jack at full force, he'd be out of here by now, and he may be very soon. Foreman is closing in on the end of this bout as he drives Sikorsky across the ring. A minute to go. And Rocky is not by trade a boxer, so for him to buy time here is not going to be that easy. Well, he is very wobbly, and the punishment continues. That jab flush in the face time and time again. The chopping right hands, now the hooks. Foreman just teeing off on Sikorsky. Rocky somehow stays there and comes back for more. Part of the interest in the lure here is that even though Sikorsky hasn't fought, the top of the heavyweight division has not been knocked out. So part of Foreman's mission here tonight, whatever you think of what he's doing, was to get a knockout. That was important. My goodness. Look at his head snapping back. He reminds me of Randy Tex Cobb, the way he can take punches, but he's taking a terrible beating in the process. This is brutal. It is over. Richard Steele's had enough, and frankly, so have I. trick people and act like I wasn't in shape because if I would have truly revealed the real George Foreman, yeah. they would never have gotten in the ring with me. So I had yeah. to play games. But this time, you're going to see muscles all in my toes. <laughs> <laughs> if I take my shoes off. So, so now you're, you're working on that. That will be uh, one well, of your goals. It's real yeah. easy. It's real easy. I just never wanted to do it mm -hmm. because uh, Tyson and those guys were literally becoming more and more afraid of me. Uh -huh. But now, what do, you think of, what do you think of Tyson now? Well, not very much. Really? Yeah. <laughs> If Mike Tyson was, was around with us, you'd have never heard of him. Why? Why are you saying that? George Foreman would have broke him in half in one or two rounds. Give me the first five. Kenny Norton would have ate him up. Oh, Muhammad Ali George. would have slapped him all over the <laughs> ring. I got Joe Frazier, doubled on left hook, tripled on left hook. George still has an opportunity to fight him. George, uh, sure. George knows what I tell him all the time. Now, are you, are you you're eager for the title shot, obviously. Oh, no doubt it's destined. Yeah. I mean, to become heavyweight champ of the world. Now, what do you know about Evander Holyfield? Oh, that uh, he's the heavyweight champ of the world. He's always in good shape. Right. He's a real tough guy. He weighs about 208 pounds. 208. I, yeah. yeah. I eat that much for breakfast. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking him light. Yeah. <laughs> so, do you... Do you th now, <laughs> now, is there is there the slightest a shadow of doubt in your mind that uh, Evander will uh, be tougher than you think? Can oh, he's going to be tough. Yeah. The, I want him to be tough. Right. Why, why do you want him to be tough? I'm going to say, would you walk into my parlor? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Said the spider to the fly. Right. Tis the prettiest little parlor that you ever did spy. But when I get in the ring with Evander Holyfield, right. he's going to start running from me. And the folks going to say, you're running from a senior citizen boy. Get in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to lick my chops. Yeah. I got you now, baby. Yeah. Bring and, it to daddy. And what, what is your prediction for that fight? Oh, I'm going to knock him out in two rounds. Two rounds. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm going to give the whole world one round for the show. Mm -hmm. Sure. And as Muhammad Ali would say, <laughs> in two he must go. Yeah. Uh, we were called uh, the, the finishers. There are few fighters in the, in the boxing sport who are 
uh, who get the name of not only being a knockout puncher, but a finisher. A puncher, but a finisher. I was one who would finish it. If I got a fella on the hook, I would get him out. Well, when I think about boxing, I, I wouldn't, I just want to be known as a good boxer. When you think about boxers in general, I think the, the history of boxing, Joe Lewis, Rocky Marciano, Jack Dempsey, uh, Jack Johnson. I would like for my name to be mentioned among those great ones in a boxing conversation. And uh, I just like to be remembered as one of them.